listen, look, where are we? I think we were on 11-4, if I remember correctly. Oh, were we? I Section... thought we finished. Uh, I thought oh, we wait, wait you're, right, you're right. Okay, so yeah, no, because we're on chapter 12. Okay, yep, I'm absolutely wrong. Mm -hmm. I think it might have been 12-4. I think for some reason I'm thinking point four <laughs> was where we were. Mm. We got some way through this, actually. Um, uh, Mikhail was saying that he might join in soon. I, I don't know when. Uh, or oh, certainly okay. alluded to that. Um, so... Um, so yeah, so okay, my uh, my mistake there. Sorry, I guess it has been longer than I. <laughs> so the whole chapter is basically about transforming data and why you want to do it. And uh, yes. we went over the first part at the beginning, of the last chapter, um, mm -hmm. at the end of the last one. And I think so. Here we're discussing uh, linear transformations. Um, I don't think they do anything particularly different here. So with the most of the examples are with the height and earnings data set. Mm -hmm. um, and what do they do in this particular example? Not that we need to. Oh, they're just showing it extended, aren't they? Which is right. You know, the data set doesn't make <clears throat> as much sense as it is. A linear movement doesn't make so much sense through the data. The data itself doesn't make much sense because when you mm -hmm. actually pull it up, it's well, this is a bit weird, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, earnings don't go go below zero, and heights don't tend to go below. Well, so I don't go below 50 inches. Um, so um, there are different ways to deal with the data that make it more useful to look at. So they talk about using standardized Z scores instead of uh, ways to uh, some um, blah, blah, blah. Wait, did they do something up here that was different? Um, I mean, we did this last, the other week, so I'm not sure if it's useful to go over it. Um, uh, yeah, I remember going through that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they talk about like you know, obviously using <coughs> Z scores instead, and then you, then uh, standardized standardization, which is you know, removing the mean and stuff, so you're centering it, um, and then centering by subtracting the mean of the data. Oh, we already discussed that just now. Uh, uh, conventional centering point. Uh, I'm not. I can't quite remember what the point of that was. Standardizing, but yeah, and then I think this is where we got to. Well, we've got just uh, right, right, right. by subtracting the mean and then dividing by two standard deviations rather than one standard deviation. I can't remember why they used two rather than just one. They actually explain why in the book. I think it had to do with the scale of, yeah, if you were dealing with a binary variable, it the scale makes oh, sense. Yeah. yeah, that's it, of course. Exactly, perfect. Yeah, because that's kind of what's showing here, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's what this is meant to be giving us a sense of. Yeah, uh, in the limit, a binary variable for which P equals 0.5, that was standardized according to the scheme, would take on the values of plus or minus 0.5. Mm -hmm. um, here's an example of 100,000 trials. Okay, um, multiplying by two, Standardized deviations. Oh, you can also, so, so the same thing again, really, but just a different mm -hmm. method. And then, uh, oh, and then this part was about talking about the um, how when you split your data up into um, about regression to mean and how when you split your data up, this might be just splitting your data through the line might make sense, but actually it under predicts uh, higher values of y. So the regression line is actually much better than the principal component line, for instance, which is based on the uh, orthogonal direction. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the slopes of two plots are, that's one and that's 0.5. I've, but this is much better at predicting values than that is. Right. Which you don't really think about so much. <clears throat> anyway, um, then, they go a bit more into regression and mean kind of thing. Um, did we get onto this part? Um, so when X and Y are standardized, um, that is placed on the common scale, the regression line always has a slope of one. That's when X is one standard deviation above the mean, the predicted value is somewhere between zero and one standard deviation above the mean. This phenomena in uh, linear models is that uh, Y is predicted to be close to the mean and X is called uh, regression to the mean, um, which we know about from the fact that, like, if uh, you have a child with either, um, you know, a child who's 
have got tall parent, then they're more less likely to be as tall as the parent if the parent is particularly. And my tall. daughter, yeah, exactly. They're, we are both above average height and she's average height. So yeah. <laughs> so we've seen. Yeah, perfect. And um, also describe how this might uh, work, for example, most height, blah blah blah. And then it goes off down there uh, for a bit more talking about it. Um, and then the standardized metric, what was important about this bit? I can't quite remember. And like I said, if a woman is 10 inches taller than the average for a sex, the correlation of mothers uh, and, daughter, and adult daughter's height is 0 0.5, then her daughter's height is five inches taller than average. Based on a quick internet search of the uh, US approximated normal distribution, uh, the average height should be, 64.5 uh, with 2.5 inches standard deviation. Yeah. Thus, a 10 unit difference in scale will be about a four standard deviation uh, difference on the standardized scale. Uh, and that demonstrates there that the height would be, does it pull it out there? Would still be ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, so it's about two. It's about two. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the plot shows that in relation to standardized left and right inches, fitted line and its 95% ribbon are based on uh, red dot lines highlight the prediction of the taller than average mother for the uh, daughter's height. Mother's height, daughter's height. Right. So the standardized metric, I guess, kind of gives you a sense of scale, maybe a little better. I, you don't have to do all the math in your head, <laughs> I guess. Yeah. No. Still on the, um, still would be well within the point, uh, so 2.5, mm -hmm. uh, the last 2.5 quartile, 2.5%. Right. Uh, anyway, right, let's get on to algorithm <coughs> transformations. We use this all the time in our jobs, presumably, sure. um, yeah. because most things, particularly, particularly the uh, dependent variables, aren't necessarily uh, normally distribu distributed. Mm -hmm. Um, so you want to make them normally distributed because it allows you to better deal with the error terms, but also allows for better predictions. Uh, but as I state here, it commonly makes sense to take uh, the logarithm of outcome variables that are positive. For outcome variables, this becomes clear when we think about making predictions on the original scale. The regression model poses no uh, constraints that would force these predictions to be positive as well. However, if we take a logarithm of the variable, run the model, make predictions on the log scale, and then transform back by expo exponentiating the uh, resulting predictions are necessarily positive because of any real A, uh, exponential of A is greater than zero. Um, so what that means is don't, you know, if you've got negative values, probably want to change them into something else. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe not even use logarithmic for negative values, um, particularly if you expect to have quite a lot of them. Um, although, typically speaking, I use, we use counts data, so it's usually, um, it's always positive. And if there are negative values, we convert them to zero. Right, um, counts data or prices or, yeah, tend to be positive. Yeah, because the only time we get negative data is when sales have been uh, kind of like sent back kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and, and then you can just take that off your um, you can take that off your main amount of sum or you can just turn it into zero but it's not really something that we're meant to be dealing with so much as it's a store issue mm -hmm. um, because if, if say you've got a faulty product it's going to get sent back isn't it um, right. however this probably should be better way of dealing with that anyway never mind that's a, that's a sorry something else to think about Anyway, so basically what we do is we take the log of y. In most cases, we're not log transforming the inputs um, or the, co the input coefficients mm -hmm. at this point in time. So um, here's the earnings data set, which we've seen before, you know, the one with the height and the sex, which they've put male, which uh, they point out later on the reason why they put male is because uh, it means the model uh, defaults to um, to female as the base, mm -hmm. and um, <coughs> yeah, that works out better for this particular set of data. 
so, um, so they fit some they fit a linear model to this uh, with uh, low s. Uh, so that's a, a localized uh, smoother, basically, showing the relationship between the two variables. It might make sense to think of the relationship between the two of them as nonlinear, which it kind yeah, of it looks decidedly nonlinear. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Certainly not as straight through, is it? Mm. It seems to go kind of like up like that. Um, it's like it does anyway. a little leap there, but yeah, anyway. Yeah, if, if you can annotate it, is it? You can annotate, can't you? You can annotate, like you can kind of see, you can kind of see that it's. At, like, yeah, the curvature. You can kind of see that it, it kind of like comes up, and probably not, not quite as much as I've done there. Right. But yeah, I do, hmm. I do. Probably more like that kind of shape than the kind of like where they've got a knot here and then another knot here. I'll call it that. Anyway, um, I need to get rid of that. Okay. They're also saying we ignore the massive, or if you look past the massive uncertainty in the right and left. Oh, yeah. I mean, th this is no good. Th 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 I mean, if we were looking at this as a, as a curve, we'd probably be seeing something like this. Right. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> my draw is awful. <laughs> uh, anyway, <clears throat> yeah. So as they stay, uh, right. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, Alex states, if you look past the massive uncertainty in the left, uh, and the right edges of the plot, the relationship between height and only looks approximately exponential, which is what this kind of like shape that I was trying to draw was. Uh, the curve there, this, yes. Yeah. This will, however, require uh, we exclude those for whom earnings is zero, which is about 10% of the data in this case. Mm. Oh, wow. It's quite a substantial amount, isn't it? That is quite a, quite a few people, yeah. Wow. Yeah, I saw someone say today something like ten percent is not very much, and it, like in a in a in some report, and I was thinking it's huge. It's like a lot. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. People have very different ideas about what a size difference is important. What constitutes a lot? Yeah. The direct interpretation of small coefficient of small coefficients on log scale. So they talk about like how um, how to interpret it, and it, it, their argument is that. If the coefficients are small or close to zero, it's easier to actually, it's quite easy to interpret them relatively mm -hmm. directly. Um, so these are all log transform values. So what that means is this is $5.6, was it $1,000? Um, for um, if you're at zero height, and um, that's for each increase for each inch of height. Right, on the log scale, so zero point. So rather than zero point zero six increase in dollars, sorry, it's zero point six uh, log transform dollars. Uh, yeah. The sigma here is a bit of a warning sign. It's huge. Um, right. In relation to the coefficients, particularly the uh, the height coefficient. Mm -hmm. Anyway, to make a so they make a. Uh, image of it so we can have a look here so this is log transformed one and we can see that it pulls the data up instead so compared yeah, yeah. to this one here so the data in the first place before it's log transformed is there's an exponential curve but this pulls data away from that and kind of makes it straighter if you see the curves mm -hmm. kind of disappearing which is you know quite good to look at um, and then they compare the beta coefficients um, on the two different models. So here we've got the exponential um, beta, and there we've got the normal one. Interesting, yeah. Hmm. I thought that should be log, shouldn't it? I'm comparing log betas. It is exponential. Hmm. Oh, sorry. Oh, because they're, uh, yeah, because he's looking at the, um, the code. He's, he's, Altering the coefficients, isn't he? Mm -hmm. To expand yeah, coefficients. Yeah. Whereas, typically speaking, you actually transform the dependent rather than the coefficients. So, he's just trying to show that when you uh, make those exponential, it log transforms, sorry, it normalizes. Right. Well, actually, it doesn't appear to be normalized at all, does it? That appears to be better. The top ones look uh, not, not too terrible, but then, mm -hmm. yeah, the 
beta zero doesn't look so great. Hmm. Mm. No, it, do, it, it doesn't. <clears throat> anyway, um, so oh, this is so this is in the book. It's not too long. I went back over this not too long ago. I don't remember what the point was that it was making me found. Uh, the interpretation of the exponential coefficients in a logarithmic regression model as relative difference. Oh, so it, it's showing the relative difference between whether between if it's linear and whether it's uh, log transform, and right. how the coefficient is basically beforehand. It's between minus one and uh, one, but when it's log transformed. Um, when it's log transformed, it becomes flatter. Right. Oh, sorry. Well, it's, well, in this case, the exponential is flatter, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> so if our if our beta coefficient is exponential and we transfer it to log, we're essentially turning it into this, which reduces down, uh, cuts off a bit of the edges. But that doesn't really matter so much because. As they point out in the book, it's strange to have anything that's really high in terms of the coefficient. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You wouldn't expect that, <clears throat> particularly on a log scale. Right. Okay, uh, so predictive checking. Uh, one way to get a sense of the fit is to simulate uh, replicated data sets from the fitting model and compare them to the observed data. When using BRMS, we can conduct posterior predictive checks with the PP check function, yeah. which serves the wrapper for some convenient base plot package. So take the model, get me 100 samples, and then add this label. Mm -hmm. Seems pretty straightforward. And then there's log version of the same thing. So then we can compare the two graphs. It's lovely graphs, actually. And we've clearly nice. got a problem right here. But on this, but when we when it's not log transformed, it's a much bigger problem because a lot more of the distribution curve is mixed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not looking good. Mm. Mm. So <clears throat> then they explain why they use natural log. Um, we prefer to use natural logs, that is uh, logarithmic base e, which is one point something. One point, oh, I can't remember. No, what is log? One point three or something. Zero. Hmm. Uh, I remember. Happy <laughs> cow. Log value of log is natural log value. Two point seven. Right. It's not one point anything. Two point um, seven one eight. Two eight, etc. Yeah. Uh, and it's often referred to as uh, lowercase l and n. Mm -hmm. I think that's lowercase l and n. Well, that's how I read it. Right. Is it now? Yeah, because yeah, yeah, it is now. Mm -hmm. Right. <clears throat> anyway, so uh, basically, that's what you're timesing the value by. Mm -hmm. Um. Because as described, uh, coefficients on natural log are directly interpretable as approximate proportional differences um, with a coefficient of 0 0.05, a difference of 1 in x corresponds to an approximate 5% difference in y, and so forth. Um, so that tends to make it quite easy to interpret. Natural log is sometimes written as in or ln. Uh, but we simply refer to it as log, and people vary between those two approaches. Uh, you can also do a base log of 10, um, but people don't tend to do that as much, and that's more when you start getting a bit desperate. <laughs> right. 
Uh, <clears throat> oh, and <clears throat> uh, I'm not sure if you're watching uh, the uh, introduction to statistical learning earlier, but someone was mentioning about counts and uh, why is it that we, why, why not just use uh, continuous rather than uh, using binomial uh, for like count data? Mm. And I seem to remember it was something to do with, um, what was it? Your error terms not being correctly interpretable if you don't use a binomial distribution. So you can use continuous, but typically speaking, it makes your error terms less understandable. And therefore, if you're doing any statistical testing, it brings it makes you more likely to be to increase your margin of error. Uh, in terms of your interpretation, doesn't it? Hmm. Uh, why did I mention that? I it's somehow related to this. I can't remember why. Never mind. Oh yeah, because um, because what, what put, someone mentioned that um, you can just do um, log transformation, but it creates problems if you've got zero values. But then you just do log plus one, which is or log plus ten or something like that. So, you, mm -hmm. which basically just uh, gets away from doing the the issue with zero values converting into infinite values, which is annoying. That's very tiny. Mm. Oh yeah, does it happen with like uh, zero point like three five? You know, any values that are close to zero. Mm -hmm. I think anything any value that's less than one um, turns into uh, infinite value when you're doing log transformations and you're converting it back. Or something like that in R. Hmm. Okay. Um, right. So uh, the coefficients that it pulled out. Coefficient of 0 0.02 tells us the difference in one inch in height, right? because remember here, we have not uh, transformed this or this, but we have transformed the earnings thing. Uh, when we use log 10, uh, corresponds to a difference of uh, 0 0.2 change in log 10 earnings. That is multi multiplicative difference. Um, so that would be 10 to the power of 0, zero uh, 2, which is 1.6, which is what the value is at. It's about 6%, yeah. Yeah, 6%, ah, yeah. So it's adding on 6%, right, okay, see. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, as it says there, 6% change. Right, so then you can build a regression model on a log scale. Um, so this is another example, but this is applied to a natural log model to account for sex. So they add in sex um, and they use male as the base. No, male isn't the base. Female is the base. Female is the base, yeah, so it's an indicator, yeah. Yeah, so if you, if you get male, it adds on top. So, uh, so that your base is the intercept. It's only 2% larger, in, which is interesting. So um, when you add that, the height does the same thing as it does before, um, and only counts for 2% uh, change in the log transform value. Uh, blah, blah. Uh, magnitude between men when men and women is much larger. There we go, it's huge actually. Yeah, um, because this data set is from the 19. Don't know what the case is like now, but this data set is from like several years ago, it's like decades, mm -hmm. decades old, isn't it? Wider gap, yeah. Mm. Uh, draws were sampled using sampling nuts, blah blah. blah. Uh, uh, um, so when you convert these values. So they take the uh, value from the regression from the model mm -hmm. and exponential it. So this is how you back what's called back transforming. Mm -hmm. And it predicts 40% uh, larger earning for men compared to women when holding height constants, which is this here. So that's 100% plus 45% change. Mm -hmm. Uh, naming inputs. Uh, when using zero one, it helps interpretation. If you name the variable after, yeah, yeah. So this is one of the things that they mentioned. Which I thought was a nice thing to say. Um, 
and I never do it like that, but perhaps might change my, my approach. Yeah, it seems uh, not a bad approach. Mm. <laughs> anyway, at this point, it's time to pull out the, uh, what's it, how much this model actually counts for. Mm -hmm. uh, so the standard <clears throat> deviation in the R square value, so the posterior for sigma suggests that on log scale, about 58% of the posterior prediction would be within uh, 0 0.8. <coughs> Excuse me, yeah. On the log scale, that's on the log scale, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah, on log 10 scale, 12.8. This 12.8. No, it's just on the log scale. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah, and we, we look fine there. Although it seems quite large uh, compared to the other coefficients. Yeah, it does seem pretty large. It's substantial compared to the other coefficients. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. To so get a sense of what that might look like, we can plot. So they take earnings, they filter, uh, make sure they don't have any of the zero values, um, and summarize by maximum and minimum height, then crossing males equals zero, one, I, I've never used this. <laughs> it just makes a it makes a grid basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you have all the values of male and then all the values of height. It's like a Cartesian product. All oh, right. Yeah. Okay, so then they create some predictions based on that and the new data frame, which we're not going to look at with them before in the past, and they bind all the columns together. Mm -hmm. And then they create the graph, and this is how they create the ribbon, which puts in the estimate values, which I'm not quite sure where they're picking that up from. That must be inside Pred. So they have done a prediction, they bind all the columns together. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. And <clears throat> beyond segments, let's say I don't know what that is either. Let's say data. Take all the data that's come in before. So copy mm -hmm. this, slice the top eight values, and then use these things to see the aesthetics. Why do you choose eight? Anyway, never mind. Mm. New length, and then I am. Arrow, arrow. Oh, yeah, it's arrow. This is, wow. That's a pretty elaborate. Graph, yeah, pretty complicated. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can't like, say I haven't done this. I haven't done that either. You know, no, that's interesting. Anyhow, right. Let um, let's just get to the, uh, the graph. And he explains in this plot. In this plot, we uh, computed the ribbon using the posterior predictive uh, standard deviation, which we saw at the top, mm -hmm. uh, uh, rather than ninety five percent confidence interval. Um, the, Thus, these are about 68% intervals because that captures the first standard deviation, mm -hmm. plus or minus. And then we convert it back to the original metric. Uh, this means 68% of the posterior predictions would be between two, between 2.8 units. Yes. For simplicity, we restrict ourselves to the posterior mean, medians, which this means for women is about 70 inches. Right. So basically, this, this is a slight push up, no push down. What if male equals one? Is that right? I would think that male would be. <laughs> Higher, it does seem that way. It's just, yeah, because they're right up next to each other. Oh, yeah, no, sorry, it is higher. Sorry, yeah. I was looking at that and that. Yeah, just you see the fact that it drops there, but that's just because it's, yeah, starting over. Yeah, let's just draw that quickly. Uh, yeah, so if we're drawing the line across, mm. that's quite a lot. Mm. There you go, that's better. Right, yeah. So yeah, yeah. You can see the, the 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 gap here is quite a bit larger than the gap here. Right, cool. Um, 
So, I mean, that shows it pretty good. I don't get to show coefficients this often. Hmm. Actually, it's really quite nice to see. Yeah. Anyway, oh, golly. Boring this. Right. Yeah, so, so, then they, um, yeah. so then they restrict themselves. So they get restrict themselves to 70 inches and pull out the data and pull out the posterior summary, and then they can see the range of values. So this is this mm -hmm. kind of deviation up and below, uh, but this is in um, log transform values. Right. Is it in log transform values? So the 85% right. log earnings, yeah. Yeah, so predicted log, log earnings and then posterior blah, 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 and then press, and they don't seem to change it. No, they don't. So that's the range. So the range is 68% um, posterior predicted range is 8.27 <coughs> to 10.5 log earnings. So look at what it means when we exponentiate values to the original earnings, which means that the up and lower in, uh, Wild values yeah. are <laughs> very yeah. huge, which makes yeah. which basically makes a mockery of our uh, model. Yeah, it's not very helpful. <laughs> yeah, which <laughs> tell, yeah. tells you why back transforming so data right, right. in a log uh, log model is so important. Yes, um, this um, in precision in predictive power is indicated by our low R squared value, which they predict in it. So you get the model robust T. Oh, and they just use this function. They use R squared. Right. Yeah. Great. You know, it makes life easier. And it's a <laughs> tiny, tiny value. <laughs> yeah, 0 0.08. And that is on the log scale. Oh, wait, is that on the log scale? No, it can't be. That's got to be the amount of variance it comes for. Right, right. So that's just a, yeah. Yeah, it's, which is not good. Yeah, I mean, not explaining a lot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, well, anyway, so yeah. Now, after doing that, yeah, yeah. So now they fit uh, interaction model. So they add uh, height and male because, you mm -hmm. know, well, actually, the sex factor is probably more important. So, um, did you do it? so the same again, filtering out the unknowners, um, and then uh, using one. Why are you doing one? I guess just include an intercept that's not zero is what that is. Yeah. No, no. One is the that is the first step for for making a model, considering uh, starting from from uh, just examining the intercept. So like uh, the, the log of the earning, and then you you like uh, put one, which is a constant. Uh, okay. It's like an empty model, just to see how the the log of the earning um, is uh, with with the model. Then you add variables to to see how it changes, how the model changes uh, along the the way. In fact, you add the age, then male, and then and now the interaction term. But it does to to start with an empty model. Hmm. Let's see. This is um, I don't know a way to do the thing. Yeah. Okay. So it's just gradually building up the model then. Mm -hmm. hmm. Okay. So just adding another term. Well, that's not added in the actual model. Well, it, it doesn't display in the model. Right. So basically, um, I remember some something else. If you, uh, you, you cannot, you is not, uh, you are not obliged to do that. Basically, so okay. if you do, you 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 cannot do that. You just if you if you know the correlation of the of your predictors, so you just add the predictors that you believe are influencing the uh, the outcome. Uh, otherwise, you starting from scratch adding uh, with an empty model and then adding your predictor uh, to, to see how it changes. Okay. Um, 
Right. So, um, so going on from that, we um, we add an interaction term instead, and this actually makes the male uh, adding the uh, male category actually not particularly strong, um, and moves seems to move a lot of the variance into this interaction term instead. Right. So anyway. Um, right, and it shows the effect of height and sex here. So whilst there is still a separate effect, there's clearly an interaction effect as well, um, which is why this pulls away from that. That's a nice graph. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so they move on to linear transformations. To, uh, so what it's talking about here is changing it to Z scores instead. Uh, so if we want to interpret a model by its coefficients rather than by plotting, it can be easier to standardize the predictors. Um, and the reason why I talk about this is because it's harder to read uh, log transform, like, transform values for a lot of people. Um, so it's probably more a case of how to deal with uh, actually explaining it to other stakeholders or other academics. Uh, so what they do is basically remove the mean of the uh, of the coefficient and then uh, divide it by the uh, deviation of the coefficient. And they throw that these tran that transform value for height into the model. The thing is they haven't done that with the categorical but uh, categorical variable. You can do that, but it's not necessarily uh, useful here. Um, so now interpret, so here we have a Z, so a proportional change of uh, 0 0.06, which I believe is uh, 0 0.06 of a standard deviation for each inch increase. Is it inch in increase still? Hmm. I can't remember what the phrase was. Um, how was it before? Uh, same, same, same level, same, same value. No point, no point six, no point eight. I don't remember. Yeah. Like, no point zero. Uh, no point. No eight or something like that. So now it's no point on six. It's like uh, and here. So it, they then then you can uh, look at the differences within these values and say if they are stable, then mm. um, means that the predictors are influencing the outcome. Uh, if they changes, the, there's something else to to look at. Okay. So this is um, this is standard deviation change. So this is the so a one standard deviation change would would be equal to this much change in the log transformed earnings. Is that correct? That's it. What did uh, uh, because this is uh, the the Z eight. Uh, can, can you scroll uh, up for a bit? Just here. So uh, not a bit down. This is the start of a linear transformation. Then there is the the code at the bottom of the page. There's the, okay. So I um this is I I mutate eight. Uh, uh, I uh, standardize. This is the standardization of the variable. Yeah, I'm I'm just think, I'm just thinking about the interpretation. So I'm um, so for each increase in height, 
before yeah. we're talking about a uh, one in inch increase in um one in one inch increase in height because height's in inches but now because height's mm -hmm. in standard deviations then we're not talking about in, we're not talking about a one inch increase we're talking about a one standard deviation increase well and it's not percentage value isn't it Still six percent greater than uh, for 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 a unit change of the of the old com. There's a uh, sorry for a unit change of the uh, standardized value of the a of the eight. Uh, it's mm. a six percent increase of the in, in the old com. Yeah, that, that, that's what I was thinking. Um, it certainly gets more complicated when you start standardizing the uh, standardizing the, the other coefficients. Um, but here, here, I don't know, maybe when it's over the so like thirty five percent, this is uh, is um, it's not seventy, it's sixty five percent less than. Um, oh right so sorry so i've got the bit on my uh on, so when when they've done this one of the problems that they say with not um not transforming the height measurement is the fact that the intercept is not interpretable and that uh, the height uh, coefficient isn't particularly interpretable either. However, when you've done the Z score uh, changes, the intercept is uh, the predicted log earnings of the Z height and uh, male when they're both equal to zero. The coefficient for Z height is the predicted difference in log earnings corresponding to one standard deviation difference in height, which is uh, what we talked about before, if the male equals zero. The coefficient for male is the predicted difference in log earnings of males and females if the uh, Z height equals zero. Thus, a 66.6 uh, inch male is predicted to have log earnings that are 0.5 higher than that of a 66.6 inch female. Um, this corresponds to a ratio of when you convert the value using exponentials to, um, so that 0 0.35 becomes 1.42. So it's 42% difference. Uh, higher earnings in males in females, sorry, males to female. And then the coefficient for the Z score is interpreted as uh, the difference in the slope between the predictive values for the height of women and men, thus comparing two men who differ by uh, 3.8 inches in height, model predicts a difference of 0 0.06 plus 0 0.08, uh, which is 0 0.14 in log earnings, which is equivalent to a 15% difference in earnings based on height. Okay. Um, I'm surprised it Further know. difficulties, oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, um, and that was uh, that, that that was that was that was quite. I'm surprised he didn't actually add a bit explaining that. Yeah, he kind of just glossed at, at that point, but yeah, yeah that was kind of interesting. I don't know. Yeah, I think that interpretation is really important. You know, how do you interpret this? Oh yeah, yeah, because that's kind of the selling point of. One of the selling points of regression, certainly, that yeah. tends to be easier to interpret. So, yeah. And this particular chapter. Okay, so uh, the log log model, which is I think is quite interesting, is the proportional mm -hmm. changes. Uh, um, and uh, as it mentions in the book, it's about elasticity, is uh, often mm -hmm. referred to by economists as elasticity. Um, so uh, if we log transform height, uh, then we have log log log, uh, lots of logging. And again, we're changing the values quite considerably here. Uh, 
Uh, oh, yeah, there you go. It says E last is C. I'm not sure what it says the advantages of doing that are. Um, yeah, um, if, if the log transform, the transformation is applied to an input variable as well as an output input variable, the coefficient can be interpreted as the expected proportional difference in Y per proportional difference in X. Um, so for in the model here, for each 1% difference in height, the predicted difference in earnings is 1.62%. Um, that's very different to the value in the book. So for here, it would be a 1% difference in height would be equivalent to 1.01% 1 1.01% uh, difference in uh, the log uh, height. This is one times more, so it's like um, because it's over uh, under percent. Mm. So it's like one times the mm. uh, the, the, the the outcome increase yeah. in the outcome. So that like yeah. if if it was two uh, two times. The outcome for each unit change of yeah. the log. Mm -hmm. Th this is just a bit different than the last one, I think. Um, mm -hmm. So if you look at the book, it says 1.62. I think this is clearer here. So 1% uh, difference, a proportional difference in uh, the log height uh, leads to a 1.4 increase, proportional increase in the log transformed earnings. Mm. Uh, which is a weird way to think about it, um, but makes sense. Um, so oh, nice. Oh, actually, um, we'll have to sit down and think about that later. Um, taking logarithms uh, is not always necessary. The choice of scale comes down to interpretability, or it's easier to understand the model as proportional increase in earnings per inch or proportional increase uh, in proportional increase of a height. Um, so then we talk about other transformations. Uh, so this, this, sometimes I say it's useful to use square roots uh, for mm -hmm. compressing high values um, more mildly than is done by uh, logarithm, but um, it has a problem, which is uh, unfortunately models on root on square root scale will lack clean interpretation, and um, they particularly have to struggle with negative values because when things are converted into square value, they uh, turn out being positive in the end, I think. More like right. C square root. Yeah. So um, it can be problematic. Yeah, it's a bit of a problem for modeling. So, I mean, it tends to be avoided. It's, it's rare to see this in the actual predicted values. I've seen it more in the, um, in, <laughs> the predictors rather than the predicted. Um, but you don't, typically speaking, would make sure that your predictors are usually positive if you're going to use this. Um, idiosyncratic transformers. So sometimes it's useful to develop a uh, transformation tailored for specific problems. So I, I presume like a uh, box cox would probably be a good example of this because it um, varies from, um, <coughs> varies from uh, data set to data set. For example, with the original uh, height of earnings data, it would have not been possible to take uh, the logarithmic log, log, logarithm of earnings as many of the observations from zero. Instead, a model can be constructed in two steps. Uh, the first model, um, the first model, the probability that um, earnings exceed zero, uh, which we're going to see in the next chapter, and then fit a linear regression. Uh, conditional on earnings being positive, which is what they did uh, in the example above. Um, mm. These kind of models are often called huddle or non or zero inflated models. Uh, the BRM practice accommodates these. Oh, that's nice. Not Very right. handy for your account data needs. Wow. Uh, is it cool to do that? Uh, Partners, parameterization, blah, blah, blah. 
might be worth looking at this later on, guys. Um, yeah, yeah, I think that'd be good homework uh, to look at those. Can I, I'll, I'll add this to the chat. Um, okay, perfect, yeah. Where's it? Well, it's actually on Cran. So we've actually started increasing the number of uh, web, web pages on Cran. Um, right. And then they talk about using continuous rather than discrete. So I'm not uh, aware that we have had access to the handiness of data, blah, 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 to practice. So they create, to create some data, these was simulated uh, it. Yeah. yeah, simulated data. Um, and what he's basically saying here is you can use is that sometimes it's better rather than saying because <clears throat> like um i know for instance that there's a scale of uh, ambidextrousness mm -hmm. um, so people think of being ambidextrous as being able to write with your left hand but it's not actually just you know some people more are quite comfortable for instance uh holding a cup in the left hand and drinking from it or um alternatively people play the guitar probably are quite good at using their left hands as well as their right hands um, you know, even if they're right-handed, typically speaking. So mm -hmm. actually, if you just say left or right-handed, you're missing a lot of information in there. Uh, yeah, so yeah. one of the things is to try to avoid discrete predictors because it actually misses information from the, mm -hmm. uh, from the data. And then they say put it between, you know, if it's on like a scale of one to 10, put it between what, minus one and one. Um, yeah, we avoid discrete retizing continuous data and using discrete rather than continuous predictors in some cases however it's convenient to discretize the continuous data if a simple parametric relationship does not uh, seem appropriate for example in modeling political preferences it can make sense to include age in four different well bins we call them bins typically speaking so in one bin you know 30 to 44 is another bin 45 to 64 is another bin um, to allow for different sorts of uh, generational patterns, which is you know great when they read the papers and they start trying to put people pit people against each other based on generational gaps. Uh, thinking back to kid IQ, uh, mom work is discretized uh, in the same way. So does the mom work one, two, three, four? So what does that mean? So the factor one is mom does not work. Uh, in the first three years child of life. Uh, second or third year of child life, mother did work in the second or third year. Mother worked part-time in the first year of child of life. We worked full-time in the first year of child of life. We set, simply fit a model to this. Uh, to do it, factor mom's work, as we would do in a normal regression model. And then it splits that down, so presumably condition one. Which is the mother did not work for the first three years of child life, would be the baseline, so that's the intercept here. Uh, the intercept is a stand in for blah, 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 and the, as we've mentioned, and the individual factors of coefficients. Uh, to get a sense of the nonlinear relationship between mum work and kids' school, we plot. And we can see that, uh, that the kids' score is higher if the mum was condition three. So it worked part-time in the first year of the child's life. Interesting. That's quite substantial. A little bit of overlap. Anyway, um, not sure how that changes anything from what we would do normally. That a transformation? Hmm. I mean, they're calling it a transformation. I mean, it makes it also, so, so are we saying that factors are a transformation? Because we are. Um, right, uh, index and indicator variables. Index variables divide a population into categories like in one word. They take on a range of values to be relatively non negative. Um, uh, indicator variables are zero, one predicts based on the index value. And uh, these are often called dummy variables. Mm -hmm. When using BRMS, we can use variables. Uh, so a good example of this is sex. Uh, oftentimes, uh, it's wise to save these kind of variables as factors, which, uh, typically speaking, is what you generally speaking do. Um, and they talk about this in the gay data. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Oh, so this is about um, 
So that's how they've discretized. Yeah. So um what so what's the original data here? The original data is age, gender, race in favor of federal, federal marriage. Gay marriage, uh, in okay. favor of state gay marriage. And they know gay. Okay. I'm sure I'm using the word gay. Um, anyway. Um, a lot of missing data. Uh, anyway. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, it's, I suppose it's a, it was a controversial uh, subject. Some right. Some people just didn't answer. Yeah. So. Yeah. If you wade through the, uh, the uh, markdown file, uh, you'll see the data need a lot of wrangling before we're done, before we're ready to model, um, which, as you can see, is mm -hmm. the missing data. And so the, he uses case one in order to create uh, different, uh, different groupings. Uh, and so we end up with a lot of different age bins. Yeah. Right. Um, you could also use the cut cut function, but I always have to look that up every time I use it. <laughs> yeah. I have have used the cut function. Uh, I might have done it a few times. Uh, I always use case when, but I always find that it can, case when is great, but it can be a bit clunky. Case when is very clear, but yeah, it can be kind of verbose. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and we use base R levels functions to examine the levels of new discrete variables. So basically we've created all these new levels. Uh, which is 0 to 29, 29 to mm -hmm. 39. I feel like this is not good. <laughs> and the reason why I say that is because there's overlap in each bin and it shouldn't, mm -hmm. they shouldn't overlap. The whole well, they don't there. overlap. I, I think that's what the open parentheses is. So 0 oh, to well. 29, including 29, 29 to 39, not including 29, I think is how you read that. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it's like reading, um, what's, uh, it's a bit like reading. Um, Number uh, one indexing it in Python. Right, right, right. Okay. Uh, uh, so they create, so they've cleaned up the data now. And now we fit two models using continuous as age and as a predictor of support, which uh, is the percentage of participants supporting gay marriage at state level, and the second model using discretized version. So 1.3 is the non discrete version, and 1.4 is the discrete version. Hmm. And then it prints out the models, and well, age isn't a factor, um, but yeah, it doesn't a factor actually when you when you split it out into factor levels. You actually um, do see, yeah, which makes it, yeah, which, which you would expect because you know, generational differences, particularly right, right, civilizations change, uh, change, and culture changes over yes. time. And then he creates some uh, quite lovely graphs of it. So, which is quite interesting that this is zero on this one here. Um, it's uh, very strange, was, yeah. Because there it's showing it, yeah. Pretty linear relationship. It's very, very strange, very strange. But yeah, when it discretizes it, it's um, not such so linear. Yeah. In fact, it's mostly flat in each group. Yeah, you kind of see there's little discontinuities sort of mm. more clearly. So it's very young, very supportive. The very old, very not supportive. <laughs> so anyway. Oh, yeah, wow. well, you know. <laughs> As it goes. Um, anyway, um, go. so indicated variables identify all baseline conditions. A classical regression can include only J minus one of any set of indicators. If all J were included, they would be collinear with the constant term. You can include a full set of J indicators by excluding the constant term, but then the same problem would arise if you wanted to include a new set of predictors. For example, you could not include both of the sex categories and all four age categories. It's simpler to keep them, uh, keep the constant term and all but one of each set of indicators. Mm. Mm. That's a bit of a problem. So, so as you, you have a baseline, and then you have yeah the the baseline category and indicators for the other categories, I guess. Yeah. So, I, yeah. I, as you add increased complexity, 
-hmm. your model becomes less and less if you've got several fraction levels in different coefficients it starts to become harder to interpret or to utilize the model um so it's probably not regular this is where tree where what's it uh, uh tree methods like really start to shine can be helpful for sure mm -hmm. yeah um yeah when using brms we can emit the intercepts with y equals zero x where uh, zero uh emits the intercept is not possible with conventional syntax this is possible to fit the rms model with multiple indicated variables and no intercepts using a non-linear syntax uh see section five of my ebook translation of the second edition of um statistical rethinking i have to take a look at that yeah <laughs> yeah Interesting. I, I can you get around to that book um yeah, yeah now um do you guys want to stop or shall we carry on there is quite a bit left it, it takes i'm it kind of at a good time. stopping point uh federica how are you feeling because i feel yeah, like there's a I lot to come but yeah we should probably yeah, uh, for me, we can stop here. Sure, uh, it's we are already our, uh, that will be our attention <laughs> goes. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, point six. Yeah, I'll add to this me. into the chat so that it's kind of stored in the group. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah. Um. So that when we know for next time. Um. Um. Yeah. So, I mean, this chapter is really quite long, so it's probably it's a lot. To, uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, because all the other chapters before were about fifteen pages. I think this one's about forty. Right. Um, where is it? Yeah. So probably don't think we should expect to rush through, through it in the same way that this is the other one. Uh, chapter twelve. I I think I think that I've missed the, the first chapters of this book because I've just jumped in the middle, but it turns out very interesting. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? So it's getting more interesting now than than uh, before, or is that just what the, the, the me thinking about it? I think so. Um, it certainly starts to become more interesting. The, the thing is, at the beginning, is you're kind of relearning a lot of what you've learned before. I mean, I mean particularly for for us, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. um, it might not be so straightforward if you like new and int int in, uh and never really come across regression much before, but I think all of, all, well, us, we have, and as a consequence, when we're looking across the first part, it, you know, it's like, you kind of, it's good, always good to relearn these things, but the problem is, is it can be a little bit boring and your mind wanders. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, I mean, the, part of the thing is, some of the fundamentals stuff is actually really, really important, you know, and they, they ask questions, right, or, yeah. people ask questions of, or why do statisticians get things wrong? It's like, well, because you forget the uh, the basic parts again, and then you have to, you know, yeah, it's always good to relearn them because there's only so much information you pull in your head, really, isn't there? Right, right. Yeah, and it's not a bad idea to kind of go back to, to the fundamentals now and then. Yeah, certainly. I mean, I might go to, once I've done this, is I might do a statistical rethinking, but I'm not sure about that. I might just go with the, um, the uh, lectures. I do think that, um, you know, Mikhail sent um, a playlist of, um, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, sent a playlist of uh, political uh, lectures on statistics on this particular book. And it's well worth, uh, well worth going over those because it might actually help us to go through them a bit quicker in a way um because then when you're reading it at least you've got a video to go back on and you know it's a bit like introduction to statistical learning it helps right. a lot more like being over the uh video lectures which they have online yeah i need to take a look at those probably at some point yeah i mean just um th this is it isn't it here so <laughs> Uh, what is it? Data visualization, main themes. It sounds, it looks quite, it's definitely probability, it's all probability theory. And they're all about 25, 30. I mean, that's a lot of lectures, but 
it goes in the same order, roughly speaking. Might be, it might be useful. But, yeah. mm -hmm. Transformations, are all, that's what we just done. So, right. um, yeah, I, I think I'll probably give this a go. Just like try to get through one, get through a few of them. And I'll let you know if I find it useful. Okay, so this is Patrick Kraft, Paul Sai 702. Yeah. yeah, I might have a look as, as well. Uh, it's, it's, it's already in the WhatsApp, but I'll add it to the chat. Uh, oh, you added it to the chat? Okay, cool, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, throw, just throw everything in there just so that it's saved yeah. and recorded. Yeah, it is nice to refer to. Hmm. Also, it might be really good, like, I don't know about you, uh, but like, you know, as Frederica said uh, about like, you know, um, the, the stuff at the beginning being like, you know, not really remembering it and stuff. It might actually be good just to go back to, oh yeah, look, it is on regression of stories, you can see it. Yeah. Um, Interesting, okay. Yeah. So it might actually be really good to like- Name like, themes. <laughs> okay, yeah, good. Yeah. It might be really good just to go back to like the first, you know, to those videos and just run mm -hmm. over them because then it's like, oh, refreshing that knowledge because it's taken us quite a long time to go through each section of the- um, of Yeah, the book, yeah. Anyway, uh, yeah, no, I'm definitely going to go through these videos now. <laughs> mm, looks like a good resource. Thank you, Mikhail. Yeah, yeah, very nice. Okay. Um, anyway, thanks for your time, guys. Um, yeah, thank you. Both. Great. Um, I really, uh, what we really, the one thing that I would like to do is just to, to perhaps do some more practice, do some actual practice with some of the data. Mm -hmm. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah, I keep meaning to, to dig in and, and look at it a little more. I've just kind of, like a lot of times I'll just look at the problems and say, oh yeah, I know how to do that. But <laughs> it'd be good to just, um, yeah, work through some probably. Yeah, that, that, is, that is essentially the, what I come to as well. It's like, oh, I, yeah, yeah. I understand. And, but actually understanding and putting in practice. Right, and, and I... Yeah, and I did that a lot with um, statistical rethinking, and um, but actually there were better resources on, um, you know, people that had actually worked through it. So it was it was you know more helpful if you wanted to kind of check your approach versus somebody else's. Um, and a lot of a lot of that was just um, you know getting you in the practice of trying different things and, and comparing and and yeah just that part of it so i thought that was helpful yeah uh, i i often i think i'm probably guilty of not taking the things that i learn and putting mm -hmm. them into practice on data that i have because right. when you start using it on your own data it starts to become a bit more understandable doesn't it right anyway um, anyway, thanks again, guys. Um, I will yeah. uh, see you next week, uh, hopefully. Yeah. Um, unless it's Thanksgiving. Yeah, it's going to be Thanksgiving here in the USA, so we'll be eating and drinking a lot Thursday. <laughs> oh, right. so maybe maybe yeah. not next Thursday then. So um, yeah, yeah. happy Thanksgiving for next Thursday then. Well, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, have a good week, everyone. Talk to you soon. You do. Bye. Bye.